run the program smoothly. Uh, now, without uh, further ado, I request uh, Dr. Arindam Ridha sir to uh, deliver his address. Now, it's over to sir. Uh, am I audible, uh, Devashish? Yes, clearly audible, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you so much, uh, Devashish. Right? And a uh, very good evening to all my dear students, uh, lovers of literature. So, today I'm going to talk on a streetcar named Desire. And the man who created this is the very famous American playwright, you know, Tennessee Williams. Although he was of English origin, but um, uh, I will be talking on a streetcar named Desire, but at the same time, I'll be bringing in uh, another autobiographical work by Tennessee Williams. Uh, it's called The Glass Menagerie. And I think all of you ha have heard about this particular piece. Now, when we are going to uh, talk about uh, a particular piece, which is autobiographical, we must know about the life of the man who created it, and I assure you one thing, Tennessee Williams's life is more interesting than either a streetcar named Desire or uh, the glass manager, right? Now this Tennessee Williams, his original name is Thomas Williams, heard, uh, the second child of Cornelius Williams and Edwin. Her older sister being uh, Rose Williams, mother called Duckin Williams. Now, all of you know that uh, words to describe or to define our kind of existence in this world. That word can be something related to uh, unhappiness, desolation. It can be of love, it can be of sympathy, it can be a curse even. Life picked up one word for Tennessee Williams. Unwanted. He is not wanted anywhere. He was dying in his childhood days when he was library on one person, and that person was Rose Williams, the older sister of Tennessee Williams. But Rose had a problem. Rose was schizophrenic from a very young age. Now, Tennessee Williams shared a world with Rose Williams that is usually given to uh, this class animals, both this brother and sister, they were sharing the same kind of fragility. What I'm trying to say is that they become a part of this fragile world. They were alien to the rest of the world, the world of men and women around them. But they were very much a part of the world of glass animals, the glass menagerie. In 1930s, uh, psychosurgery came to the market. It's called lobotomy. Now, you, we usually do not go for uh, surgeries for psychological disorders. But lobotomy was an instant hit. But there were high risk factors with this particular psychosurgery. Now, 
Cornelius Williams decided that Rose Williams will be undergoing a lobotomy. The whole world of Williams, I mean, Tennessee Williams got checked in. Because there were 50-50 chances. Either the patient will get cured or the patient will get into a state of vegetable, I mean, in the medical sense of the term. She will be undergoing a lobotomy and as feared by Tennessee Williams, she will turn herself into a complete vegetable and was thrown into an asylum for the rest of her life. A kind of a maddening effect came on this very lonely Tennessee Williams. It is, came in contact with a uh, lady director, uh, had a very brief kind of an affair with her. But then he was discovering something strange in himself. From here only, his fascination for men started. And he declared himself to be a gay. Nothing could be done with him. Back. Uh, Tracy Williams came back. Same kind of madness, if not more intense, came back. He was given to heavy alcoholism. He was an alcoholic, a drug addict, a heavy smoker. But the whole situation worsened. It's a pity that uh, one of the greatest playwrights of our time got arrested for uh, open homosexual behavior, drug abuses, alcoholism. His life came to an end, the most dramatic way possible. He was on for a poet's meet. He was uh, taking resort to a motel, right? And on that particular night, he was heavily drugged. Why then he I, so he had to give regular eye drops, apply regular eye drops, right? And on that particular night, he was holding the small plastic cap of that bottle in between his lips and was trying to apply that drop. Somehow he choked and that killed him. I'd like to read uh, something which he has written in his uh, will. Uh, he wrote in his will in 1972, <clears throat> I, Thomas Lanier Williams, being in sound mind upon the subject and having declared this wish repeatedly to my close friends, do hereby state my desire, please take note of it, desire to be buried at sea. More specifically, I wish to be buried at sea at as close as possible point as the American poet Hart Prynne. Now, he was a, a follower, an avowed follower of the great American poet Hart Prynne. Died by choice in the sea. I wish to be sewn up in a canvas sack and dropped overboard, as stated above, as close as possible to where Hart Prynne was given by himself to the great mother of life, which is the sea, the Caribbean specifically. So we are seeing that a kind of an obsession worked in him. He was not asking for a burial. He 
Do you want a video? Sigurian? 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 Like a similar kind of a thing you'll be finding. This obsession with steam. In a long term. I'd like to uh, quote, the rest of my days I am going to spend on the sea. And when I die, I am going to die on the sea. You know what I shall die of? I shall die of eating an unwashed grape. One day, out on the ocean I will die with my hand in the hand of some nice looking ship's doctor, a very young one with a small blonde moustache and a big silver watch. Poor lady, they will say, the queen did her no good. That unwashed grape has transported her soul to heaven. Now I should talk something about the story itself. It's a brief kind of a storyline. Uh, Blanche Dubois is coming from a very uh, well-known plantation. And the plantation had a beautiful name. It's called Belle Reeve. And Blanche was always very, very proud of this bell reef. But throughout the play, you'll find her repeating one thing, that she is a part of bell reef. Even when she got detached completely from bell reef, she, in her mind, somehow stayed with bell reef only. Now, she has come to her sister's house. Her sister is called Stella. Stella has married a working class man. His name is Stanley Kowalski. Now, this Stanley Kowalski in stark contrast with this quote unquote fantastic creature called Blanche Du Bois. I've told you earlier that the kind of things that you have noticed in uh, Cornelius Williams, the father of Tennessee Williams, the same kind of things can be traced in this man called Stanley Kowalski. But then there was something which cannot be denied. Apart from being a beast, a monster, an alcoholic, a highly abusive kind of a man, there was something very, very magnetic in him, which can be called animal magnetism. Tennessee Williams could never make out how her uh, mother, Edwina, who is coming from such a posh background, can stay with this man of an animal called Cornelius Williams. In the same way, you will find this uh, Blanche, she's totally confused. How can Stella, being a part of Bell Reef, can stay with a man like uh, Stanley Kowalski? Now, before the coming of this Blanche to boy, the real world of Stanley was, was ruling. With the coming of this Blanche, the world of illusion stepped in. And now you'll be finding the two worlds, that of illusion and that of reality, jostling together into the small, squalid flat of Stella. Blanche is not ready to come out 
of her obsession with certain things that you'll get to know i'll be reading them later as stanley is not ready to go with her whims now if i talk of illusions proper a few lines from the text now you can note down that as williams has used number 1 music number 2 light and number 3 lies to create the world of illusion for blonde to go first music the music provides both a background to blonde trauma develops the silly mood and reveals not of the protagonist coping coping i'm sorry coping mechanism the quote the verse here the pool ka tune they were playing when alan i have not talked about alan alan gray was the husband of a uh, blonde to boy a very young poet very sensible now alan gray is something important to uh, tennessee williams because alan gray was married to a uh, blonde but then after the marriage blonde will be having a homosexual kind of a relationship with an aged man she will become very very abusive and it will result in the death of alan gray so why alan gray is important to tennessee williams you have heard of straight people you have heard of uh, the same sex lovers i mean the gay people and the uh, lesbians as well but there are people who suffer constantly uh, from a kind of a confusion it's a peculiar kind of a state where you are confused about your sexual orientation Tennessee Williams had relationships with women i mean he was into uh, affairs with women then he switched to men so this confused kind of sexual orientation was there in alan gray as well as tennessee williams okay so all the tune they were playing when alan met a distant revolver shot is heard blond seems believe they are now the shot of the bat the verse of comfort this or blonde the polka music acts as a foundation for for blonde's relationship and to say music represents blonde's dysfunctional need for reassurance record again it's another song see it's only a paper moon sailing over a cardboard sea but it couldn't be made believe if you believe in me it's a quantum and daily world and me but it couldn't be made believe if you believe in me without your love it's a funky song parade without your love it's a melody played in a penny arcade no williams is toys <clears throat> excuse me for a minute
Sorry, I was in need of some water. <laughs> it's only a paper moon. It's not a mere accident that he has uh, Blanche sings this particular lyric with lightheartedness. Her lyrical choice and powerful mission shows her emphasis on staying in her fantasy world. For her to remain in her delusion, Blanche needs to feel some sense of the honky tonk parade and penny arcade represent Blanche's view of her own reality. It is deep, tacky, and gaudy. Then we come to light. Bright light attempt to expose those things in life that Blanche In response, Blanche actively lives in shadows of illusion through her clouded kind of perception. With each obstacle, Blanche needs for Blanche's need for fantasy increases to the point where she no longer can perceive the difference between fantasy and reality. The same kind of confused state where she is getting into that particular zone or area where both fantasy and reality are getting mixed. I quote, and turn that over light off. Turn that off. I won't be looked at in this merciless glare. Now she avoids, she will have to protect her image. She is in need. For Blanche, light eradicates the dark. Reality is somewhere related to light and illusion to darkness. See, just to protect her world of illusion, she is in need of what? Darkness. Then she has nothing to do with light. Light represents inescapable truth. And Blanche is not in need of truth. I'll come to that. Blanche retreats into darkness and fantasy. Why? Because she is incapable of dealing or to cope with truth. I quote again, and then the search light which had been turned on the world was turned off again, and never for one moment since has there been any light that is stronger than this kitchen candle. When Alan dies, something in Blanche dies as well. She ties her loss to the loss of light. But as she is absorbed in darkness, she is in need of darkness. On a, her inner kind of feelings should have a proper reciprocation to what? The darkness outside. Thus she hides from lights, not only because they expose the truth, but because she no longer has a light internally or externally. Her avoidance of light and truth shows Blanche's dependence on denial and deception. There is any representation of truth. Light presents clarification of her world, and this she cannot handle. Now, one thing you cannot deny that She had a major kind of a contribution in the death of her husband, Alan Gray. If she would have tried to or into his problem, perhaps Alan would have never died. She contributed in his death. 
This is what? Reality. She is not in reality, in need of reality. Because reality will do what? Reality will expose everything. I quote again, I cannot stand a naked light bulb any more than I can a rude remark or a vulgar action. Now, she covers the naked light bulb with a Chinese paper lantern. If you want to stand a naked light bulb any more than I can a rude remark or a vulgar action. This particular remark shows that Blonde should rather hide behind polite, I'm sorry, polite phrases than accept truth and reality. The paper lantern is not very stable, and it can easily be distribution. It's a paper lantern that is covering the light. This is what? Illusion covering reality. This paper lantern stands for what? Illusion. And the naked bulb represents what? Reality. Blonde treats luminous object with contempt. When exposed to light, Blanche's sense of self-worth and security is dismantled. Her aversion comes to a climax when Mitch threatens to turn on the lights don't turn the light on. He turns the light on, she cries out and covers her face. Then we come to lie. Say that Blanche is a damn liar. For many living, I mean, for many of us, Living in a world of fantasy gives a sense of security. If you have read uh, uh, The Glass Menagerie, you'll be finding Amanda Winfield, the mother, getting back to her past, soaked in a world of illusion for her son, Tom Winfield, Like Tennessee Williams, he is dragged into a shoemaking company, disgusted with the kind of job that he's engaged with. He is also into illusion, and his illusory world is getting created by what? Not to say anything about Laura, because Laura has a whole world, and she has a name even. I mean, the world of fantasy has a name even, the class menagerie. So, why do we resort to this world of fantasy? It gives us a false sense of security. She is a liar. And she refers to her tendency to lie and argues that she has no regrets in doing so. But she is happy with her lies. Now her lies, just you can make a list of her lies. Number one, she appears to be the damsel in distress, while in reality, she is the temptress figure in the play. Throughout the play, Blanche lies about her past. This is number two tries to make herself seem innocent and pretends to be the faithful widow of her beloved husband. Number three, she acts as though her life is very depressing which creates the illusion of helplessness in the minds of those who meet her. Number four, in reality she was involved with many men and she used them to satisfy her desires. Acts such as flirting with family, sleeping with 
multiple men in a hotel and having an affair with a 17 year old student proves that she is a selfish figure and she masks her last fool and selfish nature by pretending to be pure and innocent next she constantly gets herself and frequently wears white dresses to show her purity while in reality she actively takes part in acts which would be deemed disgraceful at the time now it's not that blanche is not aware uh, of a tendency is quite aware of a tendency to deceive i thought i don't want realism i want magic i try to give that people i don't tell the truth i tell what ought to be true i repeat i don't want realism i want magic i try to give that to people i don't tell the truth i tell what ought to be true blanche is in need of fantasy she needs to believe that the world is finer and prettier than it is actually through her alterations of the truth blanche forces the world to be as beautiful as to this particular relationship foreshadows blanche's inevitable descent into madness when the securities are removed she cannot live in fantasy forever when blanche is led away by the doctor her mental state is completely dissolved and she succumbs to her own madness quote whoever you are i have always depended on the kindness of strangers and quote when faced with the choice of embracing reality or remaining in fantasy blanche chooses the latter and her mental state degenerates in this scene blanche is forced to acknowledge her circumstances and as a result declines her impending placement into a mental institution simply reinforces the sanctuary of her mind she fully submits into her delusions she now finds herself in a world where reality and illusion are one now the illusion that <clears throat> worked in case of i mean with the character of stanley kowalski stella had a misgiving what kind of a mis- misgiving she always believed that though he is an evil he is basically or ultimately good at heart though in reality he was nothing but a brute and a monster who will be raping this blonde towards the end of the play now what about this alan gray the young husband of uh blonde reality is that she tries initially to hide this fact to multiple lies and illusion which she creates for example when blonde asked uh, i'm sorry uh, when uh, stanley asked about uh, alan grace death she denied an answer although at the last when meet will be asking about this uh alan grace for the first time in her life or in the play itself she came very close to reality she will be confessing all about alan grace death and her contribution to it then it uh, then we come to mitch it appears that blonde and mitch represent the soul soulmate archetype but in reality blonde just uses mitch as a means to hide and escape from the reality of her life now i have not introduced mitch to you people uh mitch is the friend of uh the group of friends which uh, stanley uh, brings to he was the only decent and gentle kind of man 
Now, the moment Blanche saw the, this particular man, Mitch, and came to know about his gentle behavior on him. It's not that uh, uh, she is in love with Mitch or something like that. She was simply trying to use Mitch. She has lost her ancestral property, Belle Reeve. She has lost her job as a school teacher. Rather, she was kicked out of the school because she was having a relationship with an underage, I mean, a 17 year old student. So she will have to think of a kind of an accommodation which can give her security, monetary stability, and somewhat a peaceful kind of life. So, let's quickly go with a few points which you must know. If you really uh, talk on illusion and reality, number one, Blanche experiences a loss of innocence after her husband's death. As it is at the time, she feels a world of false happiness for herself by having affairs with multiple men. Now, what can be the possible kind of experience? Blanche experiences a loss of innocence after her husband's death, as it is at this time that she feels a world of false happiness for herself by having affairs with multiple men. Now, there were many people who thought Blanche to be a good and good bad woman. If I say that after the death of Alan Gray, you cannot deny that she was madly in love with Alan Gray. And that she started having uh, relationships with so many men and boys. The sole intention was to get a glimpse of Alan Gray in at least any one of them. She was not a bad woman. I think she was simply searching for a glimpse of Alan Gray and nothing else. Next, creating a world of illusion and aiming to hide from reality <coughs> is a moral imperfection which leads to her fall as the society does not accept her and she is forced to leave her hometown. Next, for drones, the battle between good and evil is nothing but choice between lying and murder and handling her world of illusions of seeing the truth and accepting reality. This is an ongoing battle for her throughout the play, but she sometimes chooses to see the truth and lies at the other time. For example, she reveals the truth about her husband's death to meet, which shows that she has accepted reality. But in the same scene, she lies to Stanley saying that he had come to apologize to her for not showing up to her birth party. The death of her husband is something that seems to haunt Blanche throughout the play. She does not reveal that she played a major role in her husband's suicide until the end of the play. For this is the unbelievable wound which she tries to cover up with false innocence and purity. And in reality, it drives her towards desperate measures of happiness, which include constantly lying to keep her guilt secret. For this, I will refer back to that particular line. I don't want realism. I want magic. I try to keep the truth. I don't tell the truth. I tell what ought to be true. I'm just repeating the same thing. 
Blanche needs the option of fantasy. He needs to believe that the world is kinder and prettier and it is accurate. Before concluding this particular lecture, uh, I'll just give you an example from a very new film from the Bengali film industry. It's called Shamantural. I really don't know how many of you have seen that particular movie. Uh, Parambrato Chattopadhyay was in the lead role. I'll just give a small example before I conclude. Parambrato was standing, I mean the character, the role played by him, right? Uh, he's a homosexual, a gay, right? He was standing on his uh, rooftop, right? And all of a sudden, he was uh, shocked with cries and abuses. He just looked down, saw a rickshaw puller getting scolded, abused, beaten by a man. Because accidentally the rickshaw puller slipped and the man fell down. He was getting beaten up by that man. Now this forum to, I mean the role that he played, he cannot alter the situation. He has no power. So what he did, he just closed his eyes and when he reopened his eyes, he was seeing what the man who came down from the rickshaw is apologizing to that rickshaw puller. That was not happening. He was only imagining. He was only creating a world of illusion where everything is kinder and prettier. The kind of kindness, the kind of sympathy that you can expect from the world of illusion, from the world of reality. Thank you so much, Ishanidhi. Thank you, Devashish. Devashish, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for your wonderful and insightful uh, talk on the topic, which has opened up some new perspective among us, surely, uh, and I, I believe it would. Uh, now, as in our question answer session, as I have found, we have uh, have not received any such question. Okay. Uh, uh, there is a request uh, on my part, sir, to you, sir. Uh, yeah. As as we know, uh, Tennessee Williams works are associated with visceral themes. So, uh, would you please, can you, can you, can you please repeat? Uh, as we know that Tennessee Williams works uh, are associated with visceral themes. So, of course, in briefly, uh, with special reference to uh, class menagerie and uh, a streetcar named Desire. That, that is a request from me, actually, not a question at all. I think uh, you should write down the question. I cannot hear the words that we're using. Hello, sir. Sir, you got it. Sir, am I audible? Sir. 
Sir, am I audible? Uh, sir, are you there, sir? Sir, am I audible? Devashish, sir, you are audible. Oh. Thank you.